life was that river. And that river taught value. And it also taught people how to sustain themselves. days after a flood, we were told not to drink water from the taps, so we drank water from the river. On those days when someone came to the house in the morning, the first thing they looked at was the bucket of water. If the water was murky and muddy, they knew the water had just recently been dipped from the river. If the water was clear, they knew the water had been dipped from the river the night before. Regardless of whether the water was muddy or clear, everybody drank a cup of coffee before leaving our house. When someone mentioned the muddy water in the buckets down at the river, it still makes us laugh today. Once or twice a year, it was certain the river flowed over its banks. River water poured into our house as high as the window sills. People watching the water rise in the river had a measure on the bridge up at Deming. It took 10 hours for the water to reach the mouth of the Nooksack River where we lived, so we had time to put the beds and other things up before the water came into the house. We had to put a net around the wood and nail the net to the house or the wood would drift away. When we arrived in Bellingham, the Red Cross put everybody up in hotels. I will tell you about those flood days another time. I can remember looking in the floor hole, and then like a knot hole in the wood, and you could see the river swirling underneath it. But we used to roll up our linoleum and put it on the floor, made sure that we put our shoes on top of the dresser. I remember my dad, I want you to sleep with one foot on the floor tonight, son. You know, put your foot on the floor. How come? Put your foot on the floor. He says, when your foot gets wet, it's time for us to go. Yeah, it's time for us to go because we used to have our boat tied to our doorknob. And it was time when it was flooding time. We used to have our boat tied to the doorknob. It's time for us to go. You know, little things like that, you know. Then when the water went back down, there was mud on the floor. We used to have a drill, drill a hole on the floor like that. Take the hose and wash out the floor and build a fire really hot in the house and dry out the house. And away we go again. I just remember the flood sometimes. We'd get flooded out and Red Cross would come and get us and bring us to the Savoy Motel in, in Bellingham. and. At least there, we'd get to go around and turn off the lights and stuff because we didn't have any light switches down there. We just had one little light bulb with a string on it in the middle of the, in the middle of the living room. That was the only light we had. Flush the toilet. That was kind of cool. We used to live with outhouses. You know, we used to live with all the outhouses down there. At one time, we had uh, government outhouses. I mean, they were government. They had cement floor. They had the hole and they had the seat and they had the door and everything, but we had government built outhouses and, uh, uh, but that's the way we lived. And we, I used to have a little dog and a uh, little black dog and middle of the night I had to go to the bathroom, so. My little dog would always go with me because we had a plank, those big planks, and a walkway to the outhouse way out in the back there. And my little dog would go with me. And nothing but woods behind the house and nobody else around in the middle of the night. And I went and I sat down in the outhouse and pretty soon all I had was this kind of a lock. I mean, you know, 
just this kind of a lock, you know, and and my little dog went back in the woods back there and something actually kicked it. You could hear it kick it and the dog yelped, you know. And I thought to myself, what could that be? You know, my little dog went running back in the house, you know, and uh-oh, now what am I going to do? This is not going to protect me, you know. This is not going to protect me, you know, so what am I going to do? So I sat there for a minute and I thought, I better get in the house, you know. So I went bombing in the house, 90 miles an hour, just scared, you know. But, and, you know, a very strong possibility it could have been Bigfoot during that time because there were so many Bigfoot sightings down at the village during all the years of my life that there's been Bigfoot sightings down there. And I remember fishing down in the river down there and uh, you'd go down, drifting down the river, nice and calm. Pretty sunny right here, plunk. Go a little further, plunk. And, and go a long ways, plunk. Yeah. And something was following us, following us down the river, you know. And I thought, I guess, I think, I think I better go home now, you know. It's getting dark now, you know. All the families that got to witness and experience those cycles down at the village, those were the foundational village site for the Lummi people along the stall or the river. It felt like home to us or something. I, I don't know. Every single day we walked from Gooseberry to the river. And um, we still tied up our boat in front of Grandpa's house and shaved our poles and got ready for fishing. We spent all of our time, seemed like it, at the river more, even more than we did at our uh, new home. Yeah, I think I can almost remember everybody at the river and some of the people that moved and moved in, like after Marion Jefferson and Leonard moved, um, Haynes Julius and their family moved in there. And straight across from like uh, Leona and Aunt Fran's house was the war buses straight across to the other side and we used to holler back and forth to them. <laughs> Pretty much a fishing village is what it was down along the river. That's why everybody lived there is because it was convenient for your boats and your nets. Everybody had all their gear along the river. Like uh, we moved there every fishing season. I was born as uh, Larry would say, a poor Indian child on the Lummi Reservation. Uh, and we were poor. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Larry Kinley would always say that we, uh, uh, we didn't know it until somebody told us. The people said we're poor, we didn't know it. Because we always had something. All Indian food, too. Ducks, fish, smoked salmon, salt salmon. And you know, I hear when I went to school, you know, we had just plain sandwiches, that's what we ate. Fish sandwiches, you know. White people made fun of us because we were still eating Indian food. We didn't know nothing about what they had, baloney or whatever, you know. When I lived down the river, it didn't seem like we were poor. I didn't even know what poor was <laughs> until one little kid in Ferndale School District said, you're poor. And so I came home and I asked my mom, I said, what is poor? And she, she said, who said that? I said, oh, somebody said that we were poor. And she wouldn't answer me, and so I thought it must not be important. But I have fond memories of Aunt Addie. She used to make the clam fritters. 
-hmm. And uh, she'd take the butter clams and she'd grind them and mix them with the eggs. And and I was I was just a little boy. And I went over to her house and uh, uh, she made clam clam fritters and she put it between two pieces of bread. And I never had them like that before, between two pieces of bread, and like a like a patty and the bread, you know. And and I told her, I said, Auntie, I said these are better than my mom's, you know, and, which I shouldn't have said, you know, but they were better than my mom's because my mom's fritters always kind of fell apart, you know, and, and hers all stuck together, you know. I thought these are better than my mom's, and apparently she told my mom, you know. And, I heard about it, you know, for a while. So you think Auntie's fritters are better than mine? Huh? Yeah, they were really good, you know. And uh, but and there was a uh, smokehouse was full of hogans in the winter time, or we'd get sprouts. Remember, yep. we get sprouts. We'd go up there and eat sprouts on the weekends. Uh, yeah, yep, yep. We never went hungry. And berries. And yeah. berries. Salmon Remember berries. the um, salmon berries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we never went And we used to go get sprouts all the time. We had fun looking for sprouts. We'd be walking, oh, I got more than you. No, I got more than you. Whatever, it was a challenge all the time for everybody to get sprouts. But that was, and we would go sit down by the water and eat our sprouts. I think our favorite pastime was when we would go fishing off of the bridge and um, my friend from down Marietta, he made me a fishing pole and we would go fish off of the bridge and I would catch all the bullheads and he'd, I'd make him take it off and throw it back in. <laughs> but we, we did that all the time, that was our pastime. I gotta go home because grandma would be standing down by the water and it was time for me to go. So. Sometimes I'd dive in the water and just swim home because <laughs> we could dive right off of the bridge. And by the time I dived like that and when I would come up, I would come up right near our house. None of us were. None of us were. We all dove off of that bridge. We knew it was too shallow on one side and the other side was really, really deep and we all knew how to dive not to go straight down. We had to, we all knew how to dive there. But the, we did everything in that water because there was parts for the little children and parts for the older ones. And it was just fun down there. We would go over to uh, Joe and Martha's house at, um, up the road a little bit and used to Indian dance for Joe, so that's where we'd go over and practice, and that was always kind of fun. Martha was pretty strict, but she didn't want you messing around when it was time to learn to listen to Joe and his songs and, and learning to dance. I thought that was always kind of fun. It was, uh, it was kind of a, a real community. I remember when a lot of the guys were at the big drift waiting for their drift, they'd be a, they'd have like a horseshoe pit there and they'd be playing horseshoes and you know, and waiting for their turn to make their drift on the river. So it was, It was always, there was always something going on there. It was kind of a interesting place to, to grow up. You know, there was, it seemed like there was always something to do down there. Climb around the nets or climb around the 
net racks and watch the older guys on their boats and working on boats or fishing and old Matt Jones had a rain barrel there and he had a pet he had a pet seal in there, a little seal pup. We'd go up and play with that or watch that once in a while. And And I'd go down like on Saturday and Sunday mornings. We had, all the kids used to race down to the, they called it the turnaround. They'd race down there and pick up the beer bottles and we can go and trade those beer bottles in for candy down at Baker's store. I think Rob was talking about that too. So whoever got up earliest always got the most beer bottles and packed them through the trail and go down to Baker's store and trade for turn them in for candy and then, you know, that was always, so there's always something to do. Doug and I took Dad's boat to Baker's before. <laughs> oh my God. You did not. <laughs> we rode down, rode without, just fine, but coming up we yep. didn't take <laughs> <laughs> with our candy. <laughs> who was, who was, uh, um, who was uh, rowing? Because it was easy both going down. Both of us, we both had oh, one. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, one, oh, one on one guy, side, one on the other side. You guys' arms would be too short. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, Howard oh, came by goodness. and said, what are you guys doing? And he told us, uh, he uh, got that, got his rope out and told us upriver, remember? And we were thinking, oh, we're in so much trouble. He never told Dad. <gasps> oh, oh, my God. God. So <laughs> <didn't get> <laughs> she never remembers that part. <laughs> <laughs> we went to the store, yeah, at Baker's. How would you guys even know how to do that? I don't know. Well, you could just drift down the river. Yeah. <laughs> you were able to drift down the river and park. Must have been Darlene's and idea. Up. And tie it back with one of the frogs. Yeah, going up river. We were hanging on to the branches. Because <laughs> we were floating down, not up. Oh, my God. So crazy. Yeah. The only story I remember is um, Mom was pregnant with me, and she had to go to the hospital. And she was supposed to get in the boat, you know, skip. And, um... The skip got away, of course. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. used to have a phone, and we were, we would call, this is what we did, we would call, we would take turns calling uh, Baker's. She had a laughing machine. <laughs> I'd go to the store, she would call Baker's, and he would run over and answer it, and I could hear that machine oh, laughing. <laughs> wow. And then I'd go out, and then she would go in, and then I would call <laughs> And I remember it was still kind of a hot summer, sunny day, and my sister Lori and Deborah were playing on a sandbar across. I don't know how they got over. They must have walked down the bridge, because you could you could climb down that bridge and get on the sandbar. We're holding hands, and uh, and the uh, um, sandbar was like this, and then pretty soon it went like that, and uh, and we just dropped straight down, and. Um, I remember seeing the uh, grass going like that in the water, and it was really pretty and got real peaceful. And I quit screaming and everything, and pretty soon I remember somebody grabbing my hair and throwing me in a boat. Deborah must have stepped in a, uh, in a little channel there, and she went over her head, and so she started drifting down. And, that, and we were on the, mom and dad were on the other side of the, bank and I, I was over there with them and I can remember mom and dad screaming. Just We just happened to be going over the bridge and I could hear them hollering for help and Greg was with me on his car so we went flying down to where he parked his boat. And pretty soon there was a boat that come up and grabbed Deborah out of the water and pulled her in the boat. It was Connie Martin. If that boat didn't show up Deborah probably would have drowned it. Harold Olson uh, uh, used to say, hey, you know, I saved your life once. My mom said, yeah, you fell overboard and all that was sticking up was your, uh, your yellow hair. And uh, Harold reached over and grabbed me by the hair and pulled me out of the river. So, you know, all the families around there were real close. Winter time, the river froze over and it was about that thick of ice all every winter we we would go skating 
on our, <laughs> just on our, with our socks on, on, on that ice. Bobby was the only one with skates. We caught many sturgeon in our river. I mean, great big sturgeons in our river. And uh, I used to watch those old guys butcher the sturgeon. And uh, it's a real trick to butchering a sturgeon, how to bleed them. And uh, but we were the fish buyers for many years. And I used to listen to my grandfather and my granduncle talk about how the Nooksack River was connected to the Fraser. At one time, the Nooksack was a tributary to the Fraser, and that's why we used to have so many sockeye go up our river, and sturgeons go up our river, because they had the scent of the Fraser. You see, and uh, but. Then what happened was a farmer up there built a dam and blocked off that tributary. So that cut us off from that scent. So we don't have no more sockeye or sturgeons going up our river anymore. But I used to watch them at the big drift, how they would Everybody would take their turn to set their net. Everybody was respectful of each other and take their turn. You know, when it come time and everybody shared. And if you were lucky, you got it. And if you weren't, you weren't. All the men in their skiffs used to get up and say, let's go clear the log jam. We didn't have an office or a business or a Anybody that did it for us, the guys got up and did it because they knew that this is our lifestyle and this is how we traveled, was through the waterways. And they would tie the logs to their boat and then they would all take off and tow the logs out to let them adrift out into Bellingham Bay. Every year to protect their salmon, they would blow the dams in the river. They knew also that they had to protect the stocks. So guess what they did? They closed the season. This is just within my lifetime. And because I used to go up by Loretta's and his mom's and his house, I would drive my skiff up there to go fishing. And so that was all clear enough to go through there, all the way down to second drag, all the way down to sawdust, and then to go out to third by fish point. It's all navigable that, at that time. So this is within the last 60, 70 years. The appointed fisheries person, and their stories of what it was like, you know, tribal members were they knew the seasons, they knew the cycles, and so they would target certain times where they would fish based on the demand. And then uh, individuals would argue that they were illegal fishing without a license. So we used to fish right out here in uh, Bellingham Bay. And, uh, they had a boundary line, I think it run from Point Francis to the off road are they call Treaty Rock. From that big rock out on the other side of Lamia uh, Island point. to the can Red Canbury over by Fair Haven. Uh, and they used to have a boat called the Governor John R. Rogers. And they'd be patrolling there all the time watching boats, make sure they didn't drift over. And we you know, for years and years they'd done that to us and even when Jim, my brother Junior, was running a boat out there, we all fished with him. And I can remember us and just picking it up so fast, you know, so it wouldn't drift and everything was done by hand. And we'd have to pick up real fast and ebb tide, make sure we didn't drift over that line because that boat would be standing there watching us. They had to give us a hard time, the governor, Governor John R. Rogers. 
run that line all day long, running the, they were that strict to us that they, that they made that uh, game warden run the line all day long. When I was young and raising my family and everything, I hated to miss a day of fishing. I just couldn't think of not being out there with the rest of the boys. You get that feeling, you know, that you want to be out in the water. We had good fishermen, you know, and we still do today. All Lummy boys are all good fishermen. I've done it from when I was big enough to row a boat, too, so it's kind of natural for me, but I told them, you just can't jump in a boat and go fishing. You got to learn waters, learn everything, you know, like. I don't even need a chart. I can just go sit in place I want. I don't know if I'm in a reef or in a shallow water. Or I think I started fishing on my own when I was probably 12 years old. I think my dad had a boat down in the, down the river, and when he was working, he had let, after school, he had let me take it. So I'd fish after school once in a while. But, but I've always been on the boat with him. He tells me stories about me being on a boat with him in, uh, he says he always used to take diapers in a bottle, so he'd have to take care of me while we were fishing. That's the story he says. I don't know if it's true or not, but I hope so. It's kind of all I've done, because it's what he's done. Probably the only thing I would do, because I love it so much. And now my son's into it, and he's fishing off on his own, so. And I see that. And I don't know how, I'm 50-some years old, my dad's 85. You know, and when the wind blows, he calls me, are you all right? You know, and, and that, I think that's pretty neat. But I'm probably going to do the same thing to my son when he's 50-some years old, and hopefully I'm 80-some. You know, and I wasn't the only one there. There was a lot of, a lot of my cousins and stuff were, were down there. And, you know, and if somebody's in trouble out there, everything stops. And to make sure everybody's all right and then go go out back fishing again so it's it's kind of neat that way it's kind of a it's like a big family you know fishing's a doesn't seem like work it's just a way of life my dad had been arrested so many times for fishing outside of the state regulations they were going to put him in jail. Uh, from what I've been told, we didn't live in the main village on the, on the river, but we lived on what my sister says is James Island, um, <clears throat> which is the island in between the main stem of the Nooksack and the uh, branch that went over to Marietta. That island in the middle is where our house was. Um, and uh, I'd say we moved away when I was about four. Uh, my dad had been arrested so many times for fishing outside of the state regulations that they were going to put him in prison the next time. So we packed this all up. Uh, and from talking to Henry Martin, he said, yeah, when you guys packed up and left, uh, your dad sold us that house for 20 bucks. So the Martins lived there. <clears throat> um, so we uh, packed us all up, uh, moved us to Seattle. Uh, my mother's aunt, uh, my great aunt, Elsie, had a, a, a house in Queen Anne. And so they moved this in there, uh, and he, my father, uh, left to go logging and fishing in Alaska uh, because that's that's what he knew. He knew how to log and he knew how to fish. He was a fisherman, and everybody that I talked to, the older folks that are mostly gone now, said he was a really good fisherman. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, they survived on the river. Uh, 
they lived on the river. Uh, my oldest sister still won't eat fish uh, because that's what they had for breakfast, lunch, and dinner was fish. Uh, they didn't have much else, and they were survivors. And so uh, my uncle uh, was telling me about my dad, the, the, my mom and him were sitting in the car at the end of Hoff Road, which is above Treaty Rock. Uh, that's where Treaty Rock is, is right below the Treaty, uh, below the Hoff, Hoff Road. Uh, they were sitting in their car watching my dad hang on to the end of his net in the storm as the waves were breaking up onto the road and on their car. So if you go out to uh, out Marietta or uh, out Hoff Road and sit there and look, uh, you can't even get your feet wet. Uh, probably for another mile out there where where the where the bay is now. So so that's a big changes in the whole river system there uh, since those times. So uh, like I say, we you know we moved to Seattle uh, uh, and lived in various different places there, but always came back home. Uh, my mom and dad would bring us uh, up and uh, stay with uh, my aunts and my uncle, uh, you know, with Walt and Norb and <coughs> George and uh, uh, Uncle Rennie, uh, Lear, uh, Rennie and Ada, uh, they lived in Marietta stayed up here with uh, Joe and Velma and, uh, and uh, Joel and Jewel and Doug and those guys for a few summers and uh, then I'd end up having to go back home, uh, which was always hard, but um, develop those long relationships with my relatives. And so <clears throat> uh, came up one year uh, was the driver for my uh, Uncle Norm. And, uh, you know, he, he wanted me to continue school, uh, said make sure that I finished high school and he'd make sure that I got uh, to go to college. Well, about that time I met Linda. <laughs> and, uh, that ended my uh, desire to go to school. The long story short is I had the opportunity to go fishing for two weeks for herring uh, and came up, took vacation from my work and the herring never showed up. thank uh, Linda for saying uh, kind of emotional for me that she was uh, giving enough to say go ahead quit your job and go fishing what the government did with us, <laughs> we, we still came back strong. But during that Relocation Act, I remember a lot of those people always came home during the fishing season to fish, to harvest, to do something with us. They always came back to Stomach Celebration, and um, a huge majority of them all came back and did not go into the trades that the Relocation Act was training them for. They came right back and did what they were brought up to do. Well, like when I was, when I was sent away to go on relocation, I went to uh, 
Tacoma, uh, what do they call them schools you go to learn how to weld and all that? Real, uh, what do they call Trade school? Trade school? Trade school? Or something, that's where I went. My wife worked and I went to school. And we, all my kids got down there and we stayed there and that's how I was building his house. And uh, I'd go to school and work all week and come home and work on the house. And we, that's all we did, go back and forth. And it wasn't that bad. It was. I think the kids didn't mind it. These things were historical because the river did run a different way at one time, you know. And that needs to be identified because there was a way it identified itself, the tributaries. And you can see the effect because someone changed it. That river is alive. That's the whole problem people don't understand. And it kept people alive. Respect yourself, respect others, and a little love will go a long way. That's my, that's the end of my story. Are we going all the way back there? Yeah. Where the house is back there? Do you not want to walk back there? Mm -mm. <laughs> I mean, let's just keep going then. Maybe we'll just try get it a little it. slower. Like that? Yeah, your instruments are good too, because most people would kind of go like this and move the whole body, but like, yeah, hold close to your body and just turn like you're doing. It's perfect. Like you're looking? Yeah. That's not what it looks like. Is that just. What was that noise? I think it's a bird, but there's a bird here. Girl, we better go. At some point when it's not as muddy, we should go to the other side and get, you know, shot across the river. Did you hear that though? That was not a bird. It sounded like a door shut or something. You didn't hear it? I'm serious. No. You didn't hear that thump? Mm -hmm. For real? I for real I didn't. Even if I did, I just thought it was the sound of um, snapping of like branches and stuff. That's what I thought it was birds. Really? I didn't hear anything. I did not hear anything that alarmed me.